as you can see from the background, background and the light and the probably unstable Wi-Fi. Today, we have yep. two Quite unstable. young scientists, Dr. Ashwini, whom you all know. She's a physician as well as a nutrition scientist. And we have Ms. Monica Reddy, a nutrition scientist from Pune. Dr. Ashwini is joining from Arakonam in Tamil Nadu. The science and the details of nutrition is dramatically exploding and the wonderful new research and the conclusions are coming out regularly. It is very difficult to keep pace with the developments unless you are a scientist yourself. But the purpose of this group is not to get a degree, be a scientist, but learn what science and medicine can offer to live happily and healthy. So we have taken a new approach to bring useful information to you. We have identified several books, which means very well-known, respected authors in the field of nutrition and health. And there'll be 52 books. And these 52 books will be presented to you in nutshell by the nutrition scientists, students, along with Dr. Ashwini, who has both the abilities to present. Today, we'll start with two books, one by Dr. Ashwini, and the other by Ms. Monica Reddy. The format is very simple. She will introduce the book. Main points of the book discuss the relevance, usefulness, and how you can be ready to work with those concepts or ideas in everyday life from today itself. Then there will be some time for questions to clarify your understanding. We'll take up two books today. And this is the first time we are working with the book presentations these are for simple layman understanding. Though these are very well-written, excellent scientific publications as books. Now I request Dr. Ashwini to present the book that she reviewed. And one more point, Miss Monica also will present in the same way. And not only these two, there are several others who will come probably one, once every month until we get the knowledge of all the 52 books in the next 10 months. If we have to increase the presentations, the book presentations, we may but because this is the first one, we are only doing two. And these books I have read, they're in my library and they are really wonderful books. 
I may have to drop off if the Wi-Fi and other things are not stable here, but I request Gita ji to continue with these two presenters and I will watch the recording whenever it is available. Thank you. Sure, Dr. Dr. Ashwini, please start. So someone has to make me host so that I can share the screen. Sure. Go ahead, Rashmi. Are you able to see the screen, sir? Yes, yes. we can see. Yeah, okay. okay. Now it got okay. blank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It yeah, is it is blank. Blank. I am yeah. starting now. Right. So, good morning, everyone uh, there. Uh, in today's nutrition book synopsis presentation, I am going to talk about uh, a book named The Masala Lab, The Science of Indian Cooking. Uh, which was written by Krish Ashok. Uh, in my presentation, I made it like a glimpse of the book so that you will be intrigued to get to know the book either in audible format or you can read by yourself. The gist of the book is actually, um, this author has written the book for uh, on the basis of a food science. That is like what happens when, uh, what is the physics, chemistry and biology behind the cooking. Dr. Say, is that cooking is like chemical engineering and uh, the kitchen is called chemical laboratory and the apron is you use is like lab coat. I will recommend this book to people who are literally, literally new to cooking, they don't know anything, who wants to know the basics of cooking, can read this book and I, can, I will also recommend this book to those who are very veteran in cooking but want to know the science behind the cooking. For example, I'm actually a new... Uh, person into cooking because I'm learning cooking. I, I stayed in the hostel. When I got this book, that time when I'm starting to cooking, start cooking in my hostel. So what happened is that uh, there was an induction stove in my uh, in my home, in my hostel. I initially started cooking uh, the rice as mentioned in the, uh, we, we just place the cooker and uh, put it according to the uh, pressure cooker mode. I put it according to it, it is showing me 2000 degrees Celsius and I keep it for three vessels. If I do like that, I, what, uh, what it is like, my rice is getting cooked very well, but what happens is that the amount of uh, water I am using is staying behind. But after reading this book, in this book, the author is telling if you are going to use a, a induction based stove, if you are going to use a rice cooker, then you shouldn't keep the uh, temperature 2000 uh, degrees Celsius and make it for the three whistle time that you normally do. But rather change it to 800 degrees Celsius or 700 degrees Celsius and let it for the normal time that you do, like three whistles, but which we normally do. After learning from this book, and then I changed the matter of cooking, and then it became like really a well cooked, right? Which was really like an eye opener to me after reading this book. So I'm going to show you some glimpses. Um, which are like just fasting facts so that you can go and read uh, uh, this book, which will be helpful. Moving on, first of all, I wanted to talk about the materials of cooking vessel. So most of the people who are actually people will be very well in cooking, but I'm still saying we have aluminum and stainless steel, but these both have a different type of effect to heat. So what happens in aluminum is that Aluminum heats up very quickly and does not stay hot for so long once you are going to reduce the heat on your stove. So it will be very, very helpful if you're going to cook for a short amount, short period of time, but, um, but you want to give a high amount of heat. And you can reduce the heat very easily if you want to reduce the heat. But what happens in the stainless steel is that it will take so much time to get to a heating point. But you can't reduce the heat or the hotness of the vessel immediately if you want. 
So what happened? If you are going to cook in a stainless steel vessel, you can't. You you should. Yeah. Uh, if it takes so much time to get heat, and then you can't reduce the heat of the stainless steel vessel. What will happen is that your food will be overcooked. This is the difference between the aluminium vessel you are cooking as well as the stainless steel one. The other thing, important thing is that when you are using an aluminium or an iron cast vessel, what happens is that there is going to be a reaction between the acid in the food, that may be the tomato or the tamil, because these are metals which can react. So it will give you a metallic taste. So, but it will not happen in the stainless steel. So this will be one disease. People who feel a metallic taste when eating from an iron cast or an aluminium vessel can change it to stainless steel. Or you can avoid using tomatoes or uh, lemon, lime juice to when you are cooking in aluminium or cast iron. Moving on to water. We all know that uh, water is very, very critical to the texture of food. And we, all, we usually see that in home, what we do is that we usually add first onions and then the garlic. Have you ever wondered why we are doing like that? There is a reason for that. What is the reason is that the water has a high specific capacity, meaning that it takes long time or high amount of energy to heat the water. So what happens is that whichever food contains more water will take a lot of time to heat. So garlic has less amount of water. The heat, uh, the heat uh, goes into the garlic will be very, very rapid when compared to onion, which has more water. So we always add onion first just because it has high amount of water and it will take time for it to cook. Whereas garlic, which will cook very rapidly because of its less water content. And the second thing is that why water is very, very indispensable in cooking is that if you want to spread the uh, heat to the vessel in your uh, while cooking, water is very, very essential because it is going to dispense the heat evenly inside the vessel. This is the magic of water. Then, signs of rice. Hmm. So we all we are all talking about brown rice, brown rice, brown rice. But there is a tip that you should not buy large quantity. Uh, in my household, if uh, I in my household or in India, anywhere else, we usually buy like for a year, year's worth of rice, at least like three large sacks, like 25 kg sacks, three at least we will buy for a year or two years, and then we will keep it. We can keep the white rice like that. that is, we can store the rice. But what happens to the brown rice is that the brown rice contains both the bran and the germ which contain good amount of fats and proteins, which will make it rancid. That means it will go waste or get spoiled. So what happens, whenever you are going to get the brown rice, you should, what you should do is you should get it small quantities and do not store for a long period of time. The same goes to the parboiled rice. Parboiled, what happens in the parboiled rice is that when we are boiling it for, uh, only we are boiling and we are going to uh, keep it like, we are going to boil and keep it like that. And our okay, boil and oh my god, I forgot the word. Okay, we are, when we are using the pot boiled rice, what we are what will happen is the same way from the bran and the germ, all the nutrients are going to get into that. What are the nutrients are getting into that fat and the protein? So we should not store the pot boiled rice also for a long period of time. But we can do it for the raw rice, but we can't do it for the pot boiled rice. This is a tip. Moving on to okay. We, uh, have you ever wondered what causes the stickiness of the rice? Actually, there is a, uh, this is somewhat on the science side, but still I wanted to tell you. The starch is, starch is there. It contains of two molecules. One is the amylose and another one is amylopectin. Okay. So amylose is like small linear molecule, whereas amylopectin is larger and it will be branched. So what happens is that in an uncooked starch, amylose molecules tend to be found inside the concentration of amylopectin molecules. That is, if you see here, what, hap what happens is that there is amylose and amylopectin. Both of them are here. If you are going to add water, what happens is that the amylose membrane structure is disintegrated. But if you are going to heat it, these amylose molecules that are uh, curly curly structures are there, no, that are going to come out. When this comes out and joins with the water outside, it becomes a gel-like thing. So the amount of, depending upon um, depending upon the amount of amylose, you are going to uh, 
decide the stickiness of the rice. What is they are saying is that if there is 20% less amino, uh, less than 20% amylose, then you are it will get a little sticky after uh, rice after cooking. Whereas more than 20% amylose, if you have, you will have a separate grains. Moving on, why uh, this is like actually the author says why organic vegetables tend to taste better than non-organic vegetables. But if you uh, if we look at a normal plant, why the wild grown vegetables is very very uh, tastier compared to the uh, the formed ones that we do. So what happens is that it is like it is actually very interesting. We we feel the taste or the flavor is uh, we we don't we just think it as a part of the fruit or something. But flavor is actually a part of plant's defense mechanism. So what happens is that if a plant is exposed to more pests, uh, it produces more uh, flavors. Uh, that is the compounds which impacts the imparts the flavor to these fruits. Okay. So when you are going to produce a non-organic produce, which is grown in a sterile, pest-free environment, you are going to get a less flavorful fruit. But if you are going, if you are getting a wild vegetables or wild fruits are grown without any kind of pesticides, you are going to get a flavorful fruit because the compounds that are produced to fight the uh, pests or all imparts the flavor. The next thing is that what the uh, point, how the, one of the mechanisms that the pest uses to sense the insectal threat is the chitin. Chitin is just like a fungal cell wall. So what we are doing is that if you are going to do an organic farming and we are producing organic fruits, organic vegetables, what we are doing is that there are so many seafoods, uh, crusts, crustacean cells, which have chitin. That is the cell wall. Okay, we are going to do uh, grind it, crush it, and mix it in the soil so that the plant thinks that there are pests invading and we're going to produce the compounds which are going to impart flavor. But actually, there are no pests. So you are getting a good flavorful fruit. Moving on to, okay, we always say eat iodized salts, eat iodized salts, eat iodized salts. But there are, time, there are times you can't use iodized salts, which is the time. So what happens is that the iodized salts tends to break down at higher temperatures and it also provides a metallic taste. You usually don't feel that metallic taste because when we are cooking gravies or any kind of normal cooking, we are using we are using the temperature less than 100 degrees Celsius. But if we deep fry or if we bake the food in the oven, the temperature automatically goes up. So at that point of time, what happens? Um, the iodized salts tends to break and produce a metallic taste. So if you look at any kind of packaged foods or processed foods, they will never use an iodic salt because they are not they are going to use only normal salts. They are not going to use an iodic salt because it is going to impart impact a metallic taste. So when you are going to deep fry anything or bake anything, don't use non uh, iodic salts. Use only non iodic salts. Then. This is, I think it is actually very famous, even in Instagram reels are all coming about this. Have you ever wondered why eating spice, spicy foods make you happy? Or have you ever wondered why you're craving a spicy food when you are like upset, depressed or anything like that? The point, the point is that the capsaicin is there uh, in the chilies or any kind of spicy food. The pain of eating chilies is actually pressurable because we have evolved in a way that after a pain, there should come pleasure. That is, after eating chilies, what happens is that the endorphins get released from our brain. This is very, very important for the happiness or the mood of the happiness for us. That's why uh, if you are eating a spicy food, uh, initially there will be some kind of pain that is due to the hotness of the spiciness. But followed by that, if you keep on eating, the brain rewards you with the pleasure. It is by an evolutionary mechanism. And this is very, very interesting. So how is Coca-Cola made drinkable? Actually, what is what is the point is that Coca-Cola is actually strongly acidic. Uh, that its pH is very lower than vinegar. If you taste vinegar, it, it is not like palatable kind of thing. Mm. Then if the pH is very, very low, that means if it is very, very acidic, how, are, how, uh, how we are able to drink Coca-Cola? That is a question. So here comes the point. 
the point is that the sweetness reduces the perception of sourness this is the uh, entire idea behind the coca cola so what they are doing is that even though the coca cola is strongly acidic they are going to add sugar because it reduces the sourness of the coca cola so like what they are doing is in a 330 gram can of a drink they are going to add 39 grams of sugar that means like the entire mind full teaspoons of sugar they are adding so from this you can know that it the coca cola is entirely sugars because uh, we can't say it is like uh, how bad it is you can see you know 330 grams if you are going to use nine full grams of sugar how bad it is that's why uh, it is actually very uh, uh, like kind of uh, kind of like an eye opening for me when i when i was reading this and the next thing is have you ever wondered why we tend to prefer acids over bases in our food that means like why we actually enjoy kind of so taste somewhat like citric taste or lemon uh, tamarind the sourness why we are actually enjoying when compared to the basics so what they did is that uh, they have found the best dishes across the world and they found what will be the ph all the best dishes in the world uh, which was ranked they found to be ph of range between 4.3 to 4.9 which means it is acidic in the nature so why it happened actually it is like an entire evolutionary process first what happened is that the plants were actually synthesizing the foods okay so when the plants were synthesizing the foods by themselves then the animals came to eat the plants then the plants became aware of uh, 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 plants became wary of the animals and they tend to try to defend themselves actually so what they did is that they produced the um, alkaloids that is the defense mechanism against the animals which are eating the plants so alkaloids are actually bitter so what happened is that the tongues actually evolved to detect the taste bitter taste so now what we are doing is that we don't want any kind of um, bitter taste because we um because all the alkaloids are all bitter so we are evolved to go on the acidic side which is, does not impact acidic flavor so over the millions of years of evolution our digestive system has developed a bias towards acidic food, uh, acidic foods compared to the basic foods because we think that the basic foods and the alkaloids have the same receptors think that they are same and they will impart a bitter taste that's why we are going on to the acidic side of the foods thank you any questions it is just a glimpse i just wanted to put some intriguing points so that you can if you want you can read actually um, because it is so much of science actually entirely so i don't want to bombard with so much science that's why i have given you a glimpses or some interesting facts very nice so if salt is good to use iodized or the other one you can use iodized salt in normal cooking but when you are deep frying or baking don't use the iodized salts okay thank you and what about lemon if you eat like if you have a uh, acidic you can't take acid in your stomach your bad stomach is bad so you get a lot of acidity so if you take lemon does it become alkaline after using it or i no, should we no. avoid no no you should, you don't need to avoid that but if you are very really severely acidic or you are getting like uh, acidic sensation uh, or burning sensation that time you can avoid it will not change into alkaline it will be acidic only what i am that uh, trying to convince that why we are preferring acidic foods rather than alkaline foods because all the alkaline foods we think that they are bitter in nature that's why we are not eating but acidic foods uh, so if you are not eating one thing then obviously you will have a bias towards the other side no so that i am telling you can use acidic foods you can eat acidic foods but if you have an ulcer or uh, like burning sensation in the stomach or the ease of egg then you have you can read a while using as the food for some time until you are normal then you can start using it so tamarind and uh, lemon juice you can use it if you are better lemon, yeah you can yeah yeah you can okay. use it thank you so i have a question which rice is better para boiled rice or brown rice you mentioned two rice yeah. for the health 
actually both of them are equally neutral. Uh, it's not that better. This one is better, that one is better. But the point is that brown rice has both the branded gem, which contains the nutrients that we need. The same happens in the parboiled rice. What happens is that with the bran and the germ only we are boiling the rice. So whatever nutrients are there are entering into the rice granules. So you don't need to worry about because they are equally nutritious only. According to the book, they are saying that it is equally nutritious. You can use anything, whichever you can, you like. The point is that rather than um, the amount, it is the amount that is consumed that is important rather than the brown rice or the pot boiled rice. You can eat both. There is nothing wrong in eating. Uh, there is no specific thing that you have to eat only brown rice or you have to eat only parboiled rice. You can eat anything. Both are equally nutritious. It's about the amount, how much you are eating. That is the thing. I'm talking about the white rice is suppose not good for the diabetes patient, right? So yeah, we can take- it is, it is raw white rice. You can eat parboiled white rice. Nothing is wrong in that. For, for those with the diabetes problem? For those with diabetes too, you can eat. Uh, if you if you have if you have brown rice, you can eat it. Nothing is wrong in that. But you are accustomed to eating parboiled rice. You can eat parboiled rice too because both the brown rice and the parboiled rice are equally nutritious. Even for diabetic, the the problem is that the amount, how much you are going to eat, that is mm -hmm. the problem. Uh, okay, for, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm, thank you very much. Okay. If anyone has any other questions, please unmute yourself. I don't think so, Dr. Ashwini. I think you can go ahead. Oh. Okay, can I make a... Okay, one minute. What happened? I have to make uh, Monica as a uh, host now. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. That, I can make my Monica host. Before that, I have one suggestion, Dr. Ashwini. Okay, yes, sir. You have given a lot of information. Yes, sir. But can you make a table? Table? Yeah. Okay, sir. Cooking in aluminum versus steel. Okay. Eating chilies and not eating chilies, those kind of. For every okay. slide, one point, please mm -hmm. make a table and send it to us. Okay, sir, we'll do it. Yes, now Ms. Monica, ready? Yes, sir. One minute, sir. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can see. Uh, good morning and good uh, good evening for those who are in India and outside of India. Uh, so today I'll be presenting about the book called The Obesity Code written by Dr. Jason Fung, uh, which I, uh, myself, I am Maunika. I'm presently pursuing PhD in the field of food and nutrition under Dr. Kavita Manan from Symbiosis International Un University, Pune. So... Uh, who is, doctor, who is this Dr. Jason Funk and why did he write this book? Basically, Dr. Jason Funk was a physician and also a nephrologist who specializes in kidney diseases. And he's from, sorry, he's from, Torant, uh, he's from Toronto. Uh, while dealing to prevent different pathways to prevent kidney diseases, Dr. Jason Funk found out that uh, uh, for Dr. Jason uh, Funk throughout his journey to, to, def, uh, to determine different pathways to prevent kidney diseases, found out that a common link was found between type two diabetes and kidney diseases. So he wanted to link type two diabetes and kidneys. So he concluded that in order to prevent kidney diseases, one has to prevent type two diabetes. But this was not case back uh, in, uh, 
back in uh, 1970s he was uh, he was very upset the way type 2 diabetes was treated because the so called traditional diabetes management methods were not working and so called traditional healthy diets were not at all yielding uh, type 2 diabetes uh, uh, patients the promising methods of controlling type 2 di diabetes so he was uh, very determined to control type 2 diabetes in order to manage kidney disorders so that that way he was into this journey of book and let's now come uh, to the last point the so called traditional dietary management methods and so called healthy diets were not were, were not only bombard, uh, were not only working but also were bombarding with too many conflicting information uh, back in 1970s so in order to cut down too many bombarding information and also to simplify this type 2 diabetes management method method he wrote this book so this book has mainly six chapters the first chapter is epidemic the second chapter the calorie deception the third chapter a new model of obesity fourth one the social phenomenon of obesity fifth one what's wrong with our diet and the sixth one and the interesting part is the solution which he which dr jason fung has come up so let's dig down into the first chapter which is the epidemic obesity is considered and was considered epidemic so basically uh, in his book he stated out that in his times most doctors and dietitians would point out key to ma uh, key to manage weight loss was to just eat fewer calories and while burning more calories but this was but uh, as assumed why obesity is uh, back back then assumptions were that people who are obese were due to mainly two reasons one they were eating in excess and two they were lazy because they were considered uh, they were considered in low in physical activity so because of these two reasons obesity was happening but dr j uh, dr fung does not agree with this fact and he also states that low calorie diets which is also called as which is also called as caloric diets are not sustainable at all and uh, late 1970s this low calorie diet was shifted to low fat diet what happened was uh, in late 1970s calories had overtake overlooked and a new diet and new dietary enemy fat which was considered a leading cause for obesity heart diseases was introduced or actually been focused on so in order to control diabetes or obesity one has to follow a low uh, a low fat diet high carb diet this soon, this pattern of low fat and high carb diet soon became trend in back in 1970s so our author again does not agree with this point because according to his uh, according to his book just not calories and fats are the causes of weight gain but in fact hormones are the ones which control weight gain however we should also consider the fact that the types of food that we eat make our hormones act in a particular way and also 70% of 70% of our hormones that affect weight gain are genetic so in uh, hormones can con hormones control our body fat regulation body storage and body fat usage the bottom line or to sum up is that there is more to weight uh, weight management than just calorie counting it's not about calorie counting or it's just not about avoiding fats and the second chapter here dr jason fung discusses the assumptions made by calories back then and which which he has uh, you know pointed out in uh, five uh, five uh, main assumptions of calories so let's uh, look into each assumption the first assumption is that you can cut down calories in and also increase calorie intake so, uh, i'll okay i'll just uh, have this summary in the uh, fourth explanation and the second assumption is that the metabolic rate for everyone is steady dr jason fung 
does not agree with this fact because our total baseline energy expenditure is very very individualistic and it can go up to uh, it can vary between 10% to 50% so each body of uh, each body has its own basal energy expenditure rate and it uh, it varies so we cannot uh, you know uh, we cannot assume that okay uh, the fat uh, the fat storage or the fat utilization is basically on body our body baseline energy expenditure uh, method and the third uh, assumption is that we can control calorie storage yes now uh, i will again go back to the first assumption you can cut down calories or increase calorie and also you can control calorie storage the two uh, these two assumptions are actually been explained by one simple fact our bodies are the driving factors in consumption just like breathing just like breathing we have deep breaths we have shallow breaths similarly our body are the driving factors for calorie intake and calorie burn so uh, so body fat regulation is automatic it cannot be regulated or uh, you cannot just uh, our body's cravings cannot be ignored of you know high calorie uh, of high calorie consumption or too much calorie burnout it has to be regulated and it will be automatic just like breathing sometimes we do have shallow breath sometimes we do have deep breaths that is basically the way it is automatic this uh, uh, the function the uh, fu the function of body fat regulation is also automatic fat growth just happens coming to the fourth assumption fat growth just happen happens this assumption is also another bubble to be bursted out because nothing in our body just happens but everything is controlled by hormones the fifth and the last assumption about calorie is that a calorie is just a calorie again this has to be bursted because that's actually not the case at all not all calories are the same the calories derived by proteins fats and carbohydrates account different calories and the body utilizes the calories derived by proteins fats carbohydrates in different pathways so one should not take just the calories just the calorie counting intake and you know calculate whether i have to burn out so much because i have you know consumed so much this is as absolutely wrong way of calculating calories and also to regulate our body functions the third chapter is that a new model of obesity so if calories are not to blame in obesity management so what to blame the answer is hormonal imbalance dr jason claims that insulin a hormone is powerful weapon that makes our body to gain weight too much insulin taken over a long period of time predisposes predisposes our body to obesity when insulin levels goes up either by weight gain or if it is injected or if it is taken by medicines or just elevated by high cortisol levels high cortisol levels will be elevated with high stress levels so uh, so insulin levels can go up with high cortisol levels and also basically with our food choices high insulin levels over a long period of time cause the body to store fat this is the third uh, third point which is the new model of obesity that we cannot just blame calories it is more than calories which is hormonal imbalance the fourth one the social phenomenon of obesity in addition to our basic body characteristic there is more to the additional burden to obesity which is nothing but our social factors it is impossible in our daily life to go to, to go throughout an entire day without being influ influenced by food industry at all the food choices that we make are partially or sometimes completely are influenced by food industry so basically he busted uh, he points out three myths perpetrated by these food industries snacking is good for your health breakfast is the most important meal of the day adding fruits and vegetables to your diet makes it healthy so these are the three myths according to him were perpetuated Per, uh, by the food industry and he also states that high levels of poverty also has high levels of obesity because uh, because of the uh, diets which has low cost effects but high in 
uh, because low cost uh, low cost foods have high density of energy and low in proteins and of obviously low in micronutrients so the lesser affordability the greater the damage cost because of uh, absence of micronutrients and also protein the fifth one so what's actually wrong with our diet dr jason points out that sugar is the most fattening of all of all carbs as sugar is made up of two sugar uh, two sugar units which is glucose and fructose glucose derives up sorry a uh, glucose spikes up blood sugar very fast forcing the body to churn out more insulin which helps the sugar penetrate into cells and uh, and later into storage but whereas fructose which has a different effect on cells cells does not utilize this fructose uh, fructose uh, um, fructose uh, fructose sugar while insulin is moved up into the uh, cells sorry while insulin is moving glucose into cells fructose goes straight into the liver the liver breaks it down and stores excess fructose as fat this leads as a fatty liver disease uh, fatty liver which is uh, this leads to fatty liver disease so fatty liver disease leads to more insulin resistance and more insulin resistance causes the body to produce higher levels of insulin and this causes way more storage of body fat and more insulin resistance so conclusion cut out on sugar and you will and we'll have our insulin back to our uh, normal balance bring down insulin and we will start losing weight so what's wrong with our diet again the easiest way to the easiest way to break carbohydrates is including of good carbs and bad carbs so how is this good carbs and bad carbs divided so it is basically divided into high glycemic load and low glycemic load which is calculated by glycemic index so when a carb has high glycemic index and glycemic load it spikes up blood uh, it, it spikes up our blood sugar which drives in which in turn drives up our insulin high glycemic foods include white bread processed cereals soft drinks and ca and candy whereas low glycemic index foods like our vegetables and some fruits contain uh, they still contain carbohydrates but those ca uh, carb carbs does not take uh, does take a bit uh, does take more time to digest and does not have the same spike or does not have the same impact on insulin levels like the high glycemic load foods so in uh, so to sum up we'll have to include foods with high glycemic load and sorry to sum to sum up we have to avoid high glycemic foods and include more of low glycemic foods so that the uh, spike in sugar levels are controlled in a particular way the solution according to dr jason fung dr jason fung suggests that these are the steps that one can include in order to lose weight and also control diabetes the very first step is to reduce added sugars reduce simple carbs which are high in glycemic load and index and the second one is reduce highly processed grains third step is make protein 20 to 30% of your total calories the fourth step is eat more of natural fats the fifth step which we'll have to include more of beneficial foods such as fiber and vinegar the part the solution which is uh, into divided into two parts the first part and the second part so this is the second part the easiest way to lower our insulin is through fasting it may sound actually very funny but there are many different ways to actually uh, follow this successful way of fasting fasting for 24 hours and for 16 hours usually 16 hours is nothing but the uh, usually overnight and also in uh, some hours in the morning or reduce calories for a few days in a week can can be a sustainable way of controlling the insulin levels and also controlling or managing the obesity and yes while fasting actually a fasting is a quite a bit tough phase one can say that fa please fast it it is the most sustainable way 
but don't we have you know a lot of questions that why do we fast and is it fasting the easiest way or fasting can be can be that easy so he has answered the most growling questions which is nothing but what do i do if i get hungry while fasting so he answered that nothing keep going the hunger shall pass the second question can i exercise yes but will i get tired confused or forgetful due to this amount of fasting or this or throughout my fasting journey the answer is no and during fasting if my stomach is growling what should i do it he has just answered that drink some water so these are just uh, these are the answers given by him which are like for the most growling questions or the most you know uh, astounding questions during fasting which is quite realistic the questions are quite realistic the answers might be very difficult to follow stress uh, yeah and the other way is to as we all know that stress we'll have to manage our stress we, i cannot say please avoid stress one cannot have one cannot avoid stress in our life so we'll have to find out way to manage stress stress uh, stress leads to the production of cortisol a hormone that influences increased insulin production so in order to uh, manage stress one has to get enough sleep meditate relax and also breathe which is nothing but breathing exercise uh he has mentioned uh like i picked out these quotes which are actually quite summarizing uh the book fasting is no different than any other skill in life practice and support are essential to perform performing it well in contrast to refined grains protein cannot and should not be eliminated from your diet so these are the quotes quotes from this book given by dr jason fong so thank you and thanks for patience listening this book is a remarkable book yes and this book answers all the questions public had for a long time why scientists say this is good one day the other is not good the other day why this is coffee is nice it keeps your heart nice and why coffee is bad for your brain all those confusing things are said not by scientists by the press yeah. maybe some scientists have written those articles but these books that we picked up are written by scientists in full in toto understanding the subject what they are saying and this book i suggest would be very useful for everyone and i'm requesting all these people to give their synopsis and they already have done but even this more than the synopsis i requested dr ashwini to make some points in the table in the same way i will ask ms monica reddy also to summarize so that you can use it then all your doubts will go away but at the same time the science is evolving it is never fixed the western science i mean therefore what was right or what we thought a few years back changes when new evidence comes in whereas ayurveda which you heard earlier from professor korada and many other people has been observed for centuries and centuries so we are bringing different knowledge aspects to you try to observe and all these presenters will give you what you can follow and please tell us if you find anything that is disturbing not helping you we will definitely have a session for that to answer earlier we ask you to give your questions 
when we have enough questions, we'll have a session just to answer them. These two presentations today are definitely heavily loaded. They are so enthusiastic to give the entire book to you. And therefore, it may be a bit heavy for you, but when you watch this video again, the points they made are very straightforward and very practical. Let us know if you want us to make any changes to these kind of presentations in any manner so that it will be useful for you practically. Now, Gita ji, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. I know like somebody was asking about the book and Monica gave that book name. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, we appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Yes, uh, if anyone in, has any questions or any concerns, you can, oh, I mean, unmute yourself and you can ask them. Otherwise, we can end the session here. Okay, I don't think uh, anybody has any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini and uh, Miss Monica coming to us, uh, India Home Senior Center and for giving such a knowledge about those books. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, definitely we'll have you guys again uh, for some other book. Thank you, Dr. Ra for bringing this informative session to us. Thank you.